You can grab your seat, grab your seat. Great to have you out here this morning and uh, good to have you in church. Special warm welcome to those joining us uh, for the first time. Uh, great to have you in the room with us. Um, friends and family that came to support the dedications this morning. Great to have you in the room also. Uh, such a special moment in the life of the church. But great to have you in the room and uh, I pray um, whether you come to this environment often or you're here for the first time or maybe the first time in a while. I uh, really as we look at scripture as we look at the sermon. I guess my heart this morning is not so much, my goal isn't so much to entertain, although I do hope it's not boring, <laughs> but uh, my heart, my goal here is to help, uh, to serve, uh, and ultimately that scripture would help us navigate life. We're in the middle, well not the middle, we're at the very beginning of a series called uh, Built to Last, and uh, well it might be the middle, if it's useless we'll change it next week, and then we're right in the middle, but uh, if it's helpful, we'll carry on for a while. But I believe this series is helpful. Uh, it's called Built to Last. It's really based out of Matthew 7, uh, a famous passage of Scripture. Uh, Matthew 7, 24 opens by saying, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine, this is Jesus speaking, and puts them into practice, is like a wise man who has built his house upon the rock. The rain came down, the, the, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because the foundation was was on the rock. It was built to last. Uh, but in verse 26 it talks about, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them on the practice is like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. You can kind of understand, it's a pretty easy scripture I guess to, to, to understand and get your head around the idea that if we put God's word into practice, we will build a life that is secure, that is founded in him, that he is the cornerstone, the bedrock of our faith, and that's what we want to build upon. But what Jesus is getting at here uh, is not so much a knowledge. He's not saying, hey, you know more, so therefore your life is more secure. He's not getting at an understanding, a lack of understanding. Uh, what what he, he's getting at here is actually a lack of application. And so what he's not saying is you have a hearing problem, just listen more. He, you know, growing up in New Zealand culture, you often come across the, the, the phrase as a kid, are your ears painted on? Jesus isn't looking at the, the Jews and going, are your ears just painted on? Listen. No, he's saying, hey, you are listening. But, but the difference of whether your life is secure or your life is shakable is, is not on what you're hearing, but what are you applying? That he's saying that it's a wise man is a man that puts revelation into application. That a wise man is a, is, is a person that takes the Word of God and actually applies it. That wisdom is revelation and action. It's revelation that is actually applied. You can be an insightful person, you can be a great understander of Scripture, but wisdom isn't in the understanding, it's actually found in the application, the doing. It's a, it's a wise man that applies the Word of God to our life. And when it comes to the wisdom of God, this morning, really what I want to do, uh, there's probably a few less stories and a little more scripture, so I hope it's a little more helpful. Uh, but there's a few things I just want to get through this morning to kind of understand the wisdom of God, and then also the aspect of this idea of built to last. Because what we're wanting to do is, is build lives that don't, don't just get us through a season, but build lives that are here to build for eternity, that are building for what's to come. And really what we need to do is build lives upon revelation, but revelation that has action to it. The revelation of God is applied to my world. And what I don't want to do is just build a life on good choices, although that's part of it, making good choices. But what we're talking about when we talk about wisdom, it's not just man's wisdom. I don't want to just do what I think is right in this world. I don't want to just make sure I make the right choices based on the opportunity in front of me. I want to make sure I, I live an obedient life, a life that is actually built on the wisdom and the understanding of Scripture. So when it comes to the wisdom of God, one thing I did is just, just did a bit of a word study in Scripture. And what does Scripture kind of teach us about God's wisdom? There's a few things I just want to quickly kind of, kind of show you about what Scripture has to say about wisdom. From early on in Deuteronomy 34, it talks about the, the spirit of wisdom. That this is talking about a moment with Joshua when he's taking leadership of the people of, uh, of God's people. And it talks about how he was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses laid hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what he, the Lord had commanded him. 
that the spirit of wisdom came upon Joshua. That wisdom isn't just a good idea. It's not, it's not just the best decision out of what's in front of me. That the wisdom of God is actually found in the spirit of God. That it's actually as we engage with the spirit of God, we, we take hold of the revelation of God, which is where we find the wisdom of God. That there is a spirit to his wisdom. And that in his spirit, we find the wisdom of God. That it's in our connection to God, we start to understand the core, the principles and the practices of God. The second thing scripture teaches us, and this is found in Job, is the value of wisdom. Job 28 verse 18 says, Coral and Jasper are not worthy to mention. And, and this is Job talking here for those who understand Job. And the, the story of Job, but it says the price of wisdom is beyond rubies. The value of wisdom is something that you should seek after above all else. That there is value to the wisdom of God. That it shouldn't be something I should just hold lightly. It shouldn't be something that I say, oh yeah, I probably should listen to what God has to say about that. It's not, it's no. The wisdom of God should hold high value in your heart. What does God say about this? What is God trying to teach me? What is God trying to say? That the voice of God should have high value in our life. The third thing then is we learn as Jesus comes and is really the, the word of God in flesh outworked on this earth is that Jesus is wisdom. That Paul kind of picks it up in 1 Corinthians and he talks about in, in, in his opening chapter to them, he says it's because of him uh, you are in Christ Jesus who became for us the wisdom of God. That the life of Jesus is a great model to look at to go, well, what does wisdom look like applied? That it looks like the life of Jesus. That Jesus embodied the wisdom of God. In fact, he goes on, and even Isaiah talks about it in talking about the coming of the Savior. He says, he will be your sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. That Jesus is our wisdom. That when I'm looking to what is wise, when I'm looking to what is God saying, I'm not just, I'm not just assessing the, the current state of culture, I'm not just assessing my understanding, but I'm looking to what does the person of Jesus have to say about this? Because that's where wisdom is found. The fourth thing you can kind of pick up from Scripture when talking about wisdom is the beginning of wisdom. What's the beginning of wisdom? What's the fear of the Lord? That Proverbs 9 verse 10 talks about how the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. That where does wisdom begin in my heart? It begins in my reverence for God. My understanding of who God is, his sovereignty, the holiness of God. That there is a respect of who the person of God is. He is loving, he is caring, he is compassionate, but he's also all knowing, all powerful. He is God. And as I have a great reverence and respect and fear of the Lord, there I start to understand the wisdom of God. That the beginning of wisdom is, in fact, Job also talks about it when he says the fear, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. That is wisdom. The fifth thing we can kind of understand when looking at wisdom in Scripture, you start to understand Psalms 51 puts this, is the place of wisdom. Yet, I like what it says here, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb, you taught me wisdom in that secret place. That the psalmist says, well, where's wisdom found? It's found in that intimate place with God. That, that wisdom starts with my understanding and my reverence of God, but then it's found and discovered and taken hold of in the intimacy with God. But what I like about this psalmist, he says, you desired faithfulness, but then he says, but then you taught me in that secret place. So what I love about God is what he desires from us, he will also develop in us. That what God is asking from us, God actually wants to also develop that in you. That God doesn't say, hey, I just want faithfulness, I just want wisdom. No, he goes, no, if you come close to me, I will develop in you what I desire from you. That actually my job is to actually un just to, to take care of my proximity of God. That I'm aware that there's an intimacy in my relationship. And, and that's not just a secret place as in, as in a, a drawer where no one is. That is part of it. But it's that intimacy as I go throughout my day. I'm aware of God. I'm in step with God. My spirit is actually alive with God. You know, when you talk about the wisdom of God and talk about these, we're not just talking about it in the context of church. 
in the context of my Christian bubble. That even Joshua, the command, the wisdom of God, and Noah, they were establishing nations. They were building housing. They were building on how a nation was going to function, that the wisdom of God isn't just outworks in my Christian relationships. The wisdom of God outworks in my world, in my life, in every aspect of my world. The sixth thing wisdom can kind of, uh, Scripture teaches us about wisdom is there's a fruit to wisdom. Proverbs 3 verse 1 talks about, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my, my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Now there is a fruit to wisdom. And that's that there'll be a peace in your life. It doesn't mean you're not going to face things. It doesn't mean things aren't going to happen. But when you lean into the wisdom of God, when you build your life, although the storms and the rain come, there's a peace in my heart that I can flourish although the situations around me don't seem to be. There's a flourishing in my spirit. There's a couple more I just want to look at this morning before we jump into the, really what I want to talk about today is verse 8 then goes on to talk about, oh sorry, verse 7 talks about, uh, sorry, the seventh thing is there is a proof of wisdom. Matthew 11 is at the, where the scripture is found. It's in this moment where, where I guess the teachers of the laws of Pharisees for a while they had gotten on about John the Baptist. John the Baptist came and as you know, he didn't come eating. He kind of was out in the desert and had locusts and honey. And, you know, he's, an, he's a character. And, and they looked at him and said, well, that must be of, of, not, not be of God. Look at him, he doesn't come eating. And then Jesus comes eating and drinking. They said, well, that mustn't be of God. Look, he's eating and drinking. And so Jesus kind of launches at them and says, the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, now he is a glutton and a drunkard and and a friend of tax collectors. But I like what Jesus says here. He says, but wisdom is proven right by her deeds. That Jesus isn't even trying to give an explanation. He's just saying, well, my deeds will show you that this is the wisdom of God. That wisdom, wisdom isn't understood just by how much you can comprehend or the intellect you have, but wisdom is actually shown through the actions of your life. That actually my deeds will show that this is the right choice. I, I remember when I was grappling with God about moving to Auckland and, 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 and kind of really felt God's prompting me to go to university and come out of the trades. And, and to me, it made no sense. It was not me, but it was, it was the wisdom of God. It was the prompting of God. And I'm so thankful as I look back now, while at the time it didn't, it didn't quite make sense in terms of what I thought was the best step forward in setting up my future. But wisdom has been proven right by its deeds. As I embrace the obedience, I now see the wisdom of God in it. I see God's hand. Sometimes the wisdom of God doesn't always make sense, but in time its deeds will show itself to be true in your life. Eighth thing we can learn about wisdom in Scripture is it talks about the benefits of wisdom. Proverbs 2 kind of opens to say, My son, if you set my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom. Kind of drops down a bit later in verse 7 and kind of gives the, gives the benefits to following wisdom. He says, He holds success in store for the upright. He shields those whose walk is blameless. For he guards the course of the just and he protects the way of the faithful ones. Saying, hey, if you lean into God's wisdom, what are the benefits? Well, he, he, that he, there's success in place for you. That, that he shields you. That he guards your path. He guards your course. And that he protects your ways. That there is benefits to positioning your life in the wisdom of God. You can embrace the salvation of God, but not the wisdom of God. And what we're talking about in, the, in this series is not just embracing God's salvation or God's grace, but actually to embrace God's wisdom because in the embracing of his wisdom, there's great things to take hold of. And the ninth thing you can kind of learn about wisdom looking throughout scripture, well, to be honest, there's a whole lot more, but and what I could do in a 10 minute wrap up, <laughs> the ninth thing for us is Paul kind of launches into it and then talks about the foolishness of wisdom. And he's talking here about the foolishness of man's wisdom. Then in, in Corinthians, he's writing and he's saying, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. He's writing here really just saying, hey, don't, don't get too caught up in yourself. Like, don't, don't get too caught up in thinking you, you got it all together. Because that's a false reality. 
It's a false reality when you think you're on top of everything. When it's just built out of your own understanding and built out of your own mind. That actually what you need to do is, you know, we'd, last thing you want to be is like that, 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 that uni student that just graduated and showed up to work. Like, you just don't want to be that guy. Shows up knowing everything and hasn't done anything. You know, it's like often we, we, we approach God and we approach life like, no, we, we, we understand this. But Paul's kind of leaning on people to say, no, approach life with, actually, I know nothing. God, can I lean into you? Now, that might not be true. You might know a thing or two. But the heart of humility, to say, I'm going to posture myself as a teachable person. That's where wisdom is discovered. That's what Paul's getting at. He's saying, be teachable. Don't get caught up in your own understanding. So if we're going to build lives that last, we need to build lives upon the wisdom of God. And at the end of the day, what I'm hoping to build in my life and what I've been able to see even in this church people be great examples of is I don't want to just build a life that remains, like built to last. Like I don't want to just make sure I'm still here. That is part of it, and I don't want to overlook that. And I, and I am inspired by people that go through different seasons of life and go through the highs and lows and the challenges and still people in this church. I've been here for 30 years. For me, that's inspiring. I don't want to overlook that. The challenges you've had to navigate, the humanity you've encountered in this room, but you You'll, you'll stay, uh, but the goal isn't just to still be here. The goal is to be here and be in hope, to be in faith, to be in love, to be with an open heart, to be in the character and nature of Jesus. And we're talking about building a life, we're talking about building a life that lasts, but lasts in the nature and the heart of who God is. Because you can finish your day saved, but be very grumpy at it. Saved, but you've missed the nature and the character of God. But when we're building life, we've actually got to build lives that, that can last, but remain in love, remain in hope, remain in care. And if we're going to look at it in this series, what we're going to do is we're just going to look at different things that we're going to have to learn how to build a model or a pattern or understanding around this thing that enables us to live life that lasts with a sweet heart, with a tender heart. There's going to be things we've got a, a thought life that lasts, relationships that last. But the one I want to look at this morning, and as I look at this this morning, I understand that this topic can, it, there, there's a lot of pain involved in it. But Christ and God and Scripture gives us a pattern on how to deal with the things of life. And not just the good moments, but the tough times. And if we're going to live a life that's built to last, one thing we've got to learn how to deal with is we've got to deal with the brokenness of life. The brokenness of humanity. What does scripture actually say when it comes to dealing with brokenness? Dealing with the brokenness of humanity. Dealing with the pain of this world. Dealing with the sorrows. Dealing with the grief. Dealing with, with what life often, dealing with the betrayals. How do you deal with the pain? What does Scripture teach us? What does God say when it comes to dealing with the pain? And I'm talking about this not trying to overlook the subject and understand the depth and the, and, 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 and the feelings and the emotion that can come when it comes to dealing with pain. I also understand that my job here, I'm not a grief counsellor, and we, we highly encourage that, but understand that Scripture does give us a pattern, some ways to actually say, no, God, God does help us in the understanding of how to deal with pain. Because through life, at the end of the day, at one point or another, pain comes. Pain does come your way. And while we can take heart in scriptures like Isaiah 61 that says he sent me to bind up the broken hearted, the reality is we're still often left with this feeling of, of what do I do or how do I make sense of the brokenness? How do I make sense of the pain? And I guess I'm not here this morning also to try and bring an understanding to why God let suffering still happen. We understand suffering entered through the fall of man. God's design was not that we'd live in it, but through the fall of man it has entered our world. But that leaves us with the question of why does God allow it to continue on? And I don't, to be honest, I don't really have all the answers to that. But one of the answers I, I do know that it isn't, that God doesn't let suffering happen because he doesn't love us. That's not the answer. God loves us. God's for us. But Scripture also gets a, gives us a pattern of a God that, 
that while he hasn't stopped it, he is there amongst it all. And that he can be found with it. He can be found in the midst of it. Often I've found sometimes Christians in our, in, our, in, in these environments of faith, they're great, but it also sometimes can have a shadow side. Sometimes Christians can be great at dealing with pain, but they also can be terrible at comforting people. Because we're often so quick to try and make sense, to try and justify why, to try and bring answers. And there's time where perspective is needed, but there's time when just comfort is needed. That there's times where you need to pull upon scriptures like Romans 8, where Paul kind of talks about how God works all things together for good. There's times for that. But there's also times for Romans 12, when Paul also writes, just mourn with those who mourn. That there's a time for perspective, but there's also a time for comfort. There's a time for understanding, there's a time to rejoice, and there's a time to, to find God and, 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 and to get a testimony out of it. And there's all great, but, but in the moment, actually, Scripture also talks a lot about dealing with the pain of it. In fact, if you look at the life of Job, the, the, the book of Job takes two, two chapters to describe what went wrong in Job's life. And then it has the next 35 chapters are about, about Job trying to deal with that. And often we, 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 we talk and we quote about the two chapters that happened to him, but we overlook the fact that God put 35 chapters in there to show a human response to some of the pain of his life. That actually he wasn't less about this is what happened and more about this is how you can handle it. Work with it, deal with it, that God actually teaches us not to just get over it, but actually to find comfort and healing in it, to find the presence a God in it. I love what Tim Keller has to say. He says, suffering will change you one way or another, but suffering won't leave you the same. And suffering does take an effect on our life. And we've got to learn, well, what is the Christian response to suffering? What is the Christian response to suffering? One of the, these three things I just want to quickly unpack this morning, that as you look in Scripture, you can kind of see this is, three kind of patterns to suffering. There's more than that, and I understand this topic is more than that, but I really just feel this morning to one of the things, if we're going to build a life that lasts, we've got to learn how to deal with pain. Pain in all different sorts. So apologies if the topic's a little bit not so happy, clappy this morning, but it's important we look at these things. First thing when it comes to dealing with pain is we've got to understand the Christian response is the understanding that we don't suffer alone. We don't suffer alone. That we know that, that God came and took upon the sins of our world, but it also shows a pattern of a God that came and suffered. A God that came and suffered with us. In fact, Christianity is the only religion that shows a God that actually came down to suffer with people. And that was a decision and a choice by God to position himself amongst the pain so that we would know that while we go through pain, there is a God that understands it, that there is a God that is there with it. And while that doesn't take away the pain, there is some comfort in knowing there's a God that I'm calling to that understands it, that understands my emotional capacity, that understands my ability to process, that understands. In fact, Vince Vitali, in a, in a book he wrote about, about dealing with pain and suffering, he talks about the Christian faith as perhaps the most unique uh, is that of the Christian God who chose to suffer with us. Suffering's greatest cruelty is its isolation. The Christian never suffers alone. That we are not called to suffer in isolation. There's two things in the Christian faith we understand. One, we've called, we, we, we serve a God that understands suffering. We serve a God that understands pain and sorrow. In fact, a, a, a professor did a study on, on the emotional life of Jesus, looking through the Gospels and going, well, what's the, what's the emotion that Jesus expressed? The emotion that stood out far above any other emotion was actually the emotion of sorrow. That actually Jesus displayed the fact that he is a God that was at times moved to weeping that he felt it, that he moved with compassion, that we serve a strong saviour, a saviour with conviction, a saviour that, that, that is glorious, a saviour that is victorious, but we also serve a saviour that feels, that connects, 
that doesn't want humanity to do it in isolation. And not only does God say, hey, I'm here with you, God also calls us as a people to be there with one another. He calls us to to turn to Him and know that there is a God that is with you, but He also calls us to be people that respond to the suffering of others, to show up in a time of need, not with answers, not always just with Scriptures to bring perspective, but to just show up, to be with those that are hurting. We're called, and we can, I've even found it in my life, take great comfort in knowing But I don't know why, God, but I know you're there and I know you understand what I'm feeling. And God, I'm so grateful that there's a church that shows up, the form of friends, the form of food, the form of a cup of tea. You show up. My heart is that we could build a church. When people suffer, they don't suffer alone. They know God's with them but they find a place where they find comfort. They find friendship. The first thing the Christian faith can kind of show us is God doesn't call us to suffer alone. Second thing is he also doesn't ask us to suffer in silence. We don't suffer in silence. That Christianity doesn't actually call us in any way to be stoic type people. People that just get on with it. She'll be right. It is what it is. You know, it, 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 it does, you know that, 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 that's rural Kiwi culture, right? That's not Christian. That's not what Christian. This, oh, no, it'll be all right. It'll get through it. It's fine. He doesn't actually call us to present to even to him this together picture. He doesn't call us to even be, to be silent any. Anyway, in fact, one commentary talk about, talking about the grief and the, and, and the move of Christianity, that in many ways Christianity pioneered the idea of grieving, of actually pouring your heart out to God, to actually engaging with your emotions, because depending on what culture you grew up in, what your family was like, how you deal with that emotion sometimes is just to get on with it. But Christianity actually calls us to pour our heart out, that we don't need to be silent in it. That in fact, you look throughout Scripture and Scripture even gives you moments. Like if you look at Psalm 88, you can leave yourself wondering, why is this Psalm in there? Because majority of Psalms, as for those who've read the Psalms, understand they start with acknowledging God. They talk about all the things they're upset about, f- facing all the fear, all the worry, all the dread. But then they finish on this high note. But Psalm 88 doesn't. It starts with, I acknowledge you, God, and life is rubbish. The end. It's it's literally how Psalm 88 is presented. In fact, if you look at it in in this opening, he he opens by saying, Lord, you are are the God who saves me. Day and night, I cry out to you. So he acknowledges the fact, no, God, I know you're there. And he goes on to say, my prayer would come before you. Uh, and turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles. And then it just goes on. Scripture, and this is how it ends. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest end. My closest friend, sorry. It, it ends on this, ah. Oh. But it's God who chose to put this in here. It's God inspired so, so you got, you, you got to grapple with, well, why does God put, put prayers like that in the Bible? Because it's not faith-filled. It doesn't end on hope. Because he's showing this picture, this idea that the believing Christian can do everything at right and at still times face dark times. And in those dark times, you can cry out to God. Not with perfect understanding or not with perspective and not with great rejoicing, but you can cry out even in your pain. And we serve a God who doesn't turn from that, who doesn't get angry at that, who doesn't despise that, but says, hey, I'm going to put that in Scripture. For, so for years to come, humanity is going to know I'm a God they can just pour their heart out to. They don't need to stand in silence. In fact, Derek Kinder, uh, uh, on a commentary on this, talks about the very, on Psalms 88, the very presence of such prayers in Scripture is witness to his understanding. He knows how men speak when they are desperate. That we serve a God that doesn't get angry at our anger. 
They would turn to him and just say, God, this sucks. I wasn't brought up really to talk, to pray like that. But God's saying, hey, pour your heart out. In fact, if you look at the, throughout Scripture, you've got Job, you've got Habakkuk, you've got a whole bunch of moments where people just pouring their heart out. You know, Job talk, talks in this moment. You look at the story of Job, obviously, for those who know the Scripture, it comes out of the understanding that the enemy and God are in a conversation, and he's accusing Job of only following God because of what God gives him. And there's a degree of reality to that. And there's a degree of reality in all of our worlds like that. But what I've found is God, through pain and suffering and finding his grace, actually really deepens my relationship with God beyond that. And there's this idea that Job then goes on and he's got his friends involved there and there's all this narrative and all this, even at times, Job's is just, just like Psalms 88, is just pouring his heart out and it's not, it's not really seeming to be of great perspective or great eternal thinking. It's just, it's just him and his feelings. But towards the end of it, it talks about how, how Job honored God. And you can ask, well, with those types of prayer, how is that God honoring and, and, and one commentary on it kind of talks about, an Old, an Old Testament professor talks about the reality that, that while Job poured his heart out and at times just said the reality of how he's feeling and didn't always have, have, have the great words of perspective, what he did do was as he was angry but angry towards God. And he kept talking to him. He stayed praying. The prayers may not be the best prayers, but they were prayers. He didn't turn from God. He took what he was feeling to God. He took it to God. And we don't need to be silent before God about the reality of what's going on now. But if we will take it to God through it and in time, you'll find the grace of God in it. So we're not called to do it alone. We're not called to do it in silence. And the last thing, this is we finished this morning, is when it came to dealing with the different pains of this world, is the understanding of the Christian faith is that we live beyond this world. We live beyond this world. That if you were to look, even if you look at secular culture, it has the idea that there is no God or if there is a higher power, it's not something you can engage with or really know. So it looks to find meaning in the here and now. It looks to find understanding and the reality of where we are. But in Christianity, we have a different understanding, a different hope. Because there are things I grapple with that I may not ever find answers to in the here and now. But I trust that there is a redeeming God. And in the resurrection, all things, all pain will be washed away. That in the resurrection, all things we may know him. Sense will come, understanding will come. But it doesn't mean I don't face it in the here and now. But the pain I'm dealing with in the here and now, either God will bring an end to it, he'll bring a comfort to it here and now, or there is some pain that is only going to find answers in the redemption of God, in the resurrection of his people, a new earth. But one of the things that sometimes adds additional pain to the Christian pain is when we live with the false expectation that because I'm saved, nothing bad's gonna happen. And so you have this pain, but then you've got this additional pain, which is the pain of, God, why me? I've been building my life upon the rock. It's this false expectation that nothing bad is going to happen, but Scripture doesn't teach that. It doesn't say just because you've accepted Jesus' life into your heart that you're not going to face the pain and the reality of the world. Unfortunately, we do. But it means when you face it, there's a God that will comfort you, that will meet you. There's a community He will place you in. There's someone you can cry out to and not get it all right, but I'm just taking it to you, God, because I'm frustrated and annoyed. And a God that doesn't turn from that. He doesn't push you aside. Say, so come back when you've turned it into rejoicing. He doesn't say that. It's not pour it out. Just bring it to me. And there's understanding I want to give you, but I, 
You're not going to understand it all right now. But one day I will redeem. Redeem this earth. There will be a resurrection. And pain will be gone and suffering will be gone. Before now, just know I'm with you. That's our God. That's the Christian response. Not just get on, get over it, you know, carry on. Because our God is... No, we get there. I'm amazed at what Christians can endure and still stay, stay in this place of rejoicing. But there's moments by which He just calls us to bring it to God. To bring it to God. 